trifecta of holidays all figured out. But uh, this morning, we have set a goal as a church to pit out 150 shoeboxes. That's what we want to send out this year. There are 50 right here on the stage. 50 that are packed already with instructions and details for how to go about doing the shoebox. And I want to encourage you right now. I mean, right now. Stand up. Levez-vous. Levez-vous. That's French for Stand up. You don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't know I was bilingual, did you? Uh, stand up, Roger. Be a supporter. Come on. Don't make me call you out. If you want a shoebox, move out of your seat. Come up here and get one. Take it back to your chair right now. Come on. Let's move. If you want a shoebox, let's get them. I know how you all are, East Harford. Got to crack the whip. Uh, we're going to collect these shoeboxes. Okay. <laughs> We're going to collect these two boxes starting the last Sunday of the month through uh, November the 17th. We're going to collect them. We're going to put them back here under the tree. We're going to pray over them. And then we're going to send them out to the destination. Uh, uh, man, once these 50 are gone, we'll get, uh, the, we'll get the rest of them up and out. How many you need? Okay. <laughs> One more. Man, second service is going to be very disappointed. Catch. No. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Y'all need two. One for each. One for each. Your holy family. No. Chief family. No. <laughs> I raised her right. Uh. Oh, goodness. Now, hey, thank you all so much for doing that. Um, I should have had Nikki uh, do, do quite a few more. Huh. Way to jump in there, Roger. But he is going to get on to me later. Uh, but I tell you what, let's do this right now for these shoeboxes. Let's pray right now over these shoeboxes. Pray that, I don't know if you caught it or not, but something new that they've started doing the last years or so, uh, since I last participated in this, you can actually follow your shoe box with the code that you're going to have uh, attached to your label. And you can see who it went to, where it went. You can see the impact that it's having. Uh, you can see more than just uh, the effort of putting stuff in there and then sending it off and feeling good about that. You can actually follow it to see what God is, how God is using it in that community, which I think is pretty awesome. Uh, and what can happen also if you write a little personal note in there, someone will translate that note into their language, and you may end up having a pen pal uh, in one of these places. Uh, so you can continue to encourage and edify the body of Christ around the world through what you're doing right now. So let's pray over these two boxes right now, and uh, we'll just pray for God to use them however God wants to. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the generosity of your people. Thank you for the fact that you've called us to be a merciful, graceful, giving people. And Lord, right now, we want to give the gift of the gospel. We know these two boxes will be filled with toys and, and, and little things that will help these kids in their daily life. But Lord, what is really there is an act of love from the church of Christ to people who need to hear your word, but they need to hear it in a way that attracts their attention. So, Lord, right now we pray for each of these shoe boxes as we fill them with our love, our hopes, our desires, seeking your will, that you would use these to see boys and girls, moms and dads, families and villages, one to Christ, that they would strengthen the churches that are in these areas around the world, and that we would see believers grow in their faith, making an impact right where they're at. Lord, help us to be on mission through these boxes. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, another word uh, this morning just about uh, some mission stuff. Uh, if you've been following uh, some of the things we've been doing, uh, we've been supporting a church up in uh, Cincy, Ohio, uh, High Point Cincy, and they went on a mission trip uh, this weekend, this past weekend, uh, to West Virginia that some of us supported uh, by collecting some donations and sending that way. I got this from Pastor Mike this morning, uh, a text message. He said, had a great outreach yesterday here in West Virginia, and a lot of people came from our Friday invitations. Uh, more came than expected. They shared the gospel in small groups over the pumpkin store yesterday. Over 50 heard the gospel, and many accepted Christ as their Savior there on the spot. So, yes! Uh, and I know that was a great encouragement to Mike and uh, the, the guys that, and the gals that went, uh, just because... Um, 
the Cincy area is a hard area to do the gospel in, uh, and they are faithfully plugging away week after week there. Uh, but to get to go on the mission field to West Virginia, to a, a, a place uh, and connect with a local church there, a little Baptist church there, and reach their community uh, and see the fruits of their efforts uh, right then and there uh, is an awesome thing. Amen? Amen. Well, hey, this morning, if you have your Bibles, uh, open them to Matthew chapter 21. And, of course, you should have your Bible, either uh, the good old-fashioned Codex, yay, or something on your phone or app. Uh, open those suckers up. Let me see the bright light of God's Word shining upon your face this morning. We're going to be Matthew chapter 21. Um, Let's remember what the purpose of Matthew's gospel is all about. Matthew wants you and I to know three things when we finish reading his gospel account. He wants us to know who Jesus is. He wants us to commit to following Jesus. And he wants us to get engaged in sharing Jesus. So, to know, to follow, and to share. Today we are going to dig into a passage. We're going to dive into another passage of what it means to follow Jesus. According to Jesus, to follow him requires real faith, a faith that can move mountains. Let's pray again over God's word. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your desire to have it impact our lives. And Lord, I pray this morning as we dig into it, as we unravel it, Lord, that it would do just that, that it would transform us, it would make us new. Lord, that we would see something in it, connect with something there that would help us not only this week in the days to come, but would help us in a very practical ways of how to be moms and dads, husbands and wives, co-workers, how to handle our finances and our relationships. God, let us see what it means to follow you. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, the question is, what does real faith look like in the eyes of Jesus? Um, I was thinking about that uh, as I put that together. Uh, you know, so many times we, uh, we, we, we talk about biblical things, but what does Jesus have in those expectations? I mean, I'd much rather know what Jesus wants than what I want. Uh, I'd much rather know what Jesus wants than what Jeremy says. Uh, I'd much rather know what Jesus wants than, than what the greatest and latest theologians say. What is it that Jesus desires? What does Jesus consider real faith? We're going to be in verses 1 through 22, but I want to go ahead and jump to the very end of this passage, verses 21 and 22, because that's where we see the meat of this teaching. And then we're going to work our way back and deal with the passage as a whole. But in verses 21 and 22, Jesus says this. The disciples have asked a question, and Jesus answered them. He says, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt... You will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you tell this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, it will be done. And if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. That's a fun passage. You've probably heard sermons on that before. Faith that moves mountains. But let's be honest, that's a very difficult passage. How many of y'all have moved mountains? Well, if you got the faith of a mustard seed, one of the other gospel writers say, just a little bitty faith. A little bitty, 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 bitty faith. You should be a bit moving mountains. Are you all a bunch of faithless people? That's a difficult passage, isn't it? To have faith. What does it mean to have faith? You know, Jesus always means what he says, but this can't mean what it says, right? <laughs> Let's share this apart real quick. I love where he starts. He says, truly, truly. In other words, there is no greater truth than what I'm fixing to tell you. It cannot be any more true than this. This is truth to truth to truth to truth. I am telling you something. You can take it to the bank. You can count on this. This is a fact. A cornerstone. Not just something that we want to believe in, maybe, but this is it. If you have faith, and there's two conditions is, is faith. Faith that doesn't doubt and faith that believes. If you have faith and do not doubt, can we just be honest? How many of y'all doubt? I do. 
uh, the, the, the man that was at the bottom of the Mount of Transfiguration. I love it. Jesus comes back down. He just been transfigured. Three disciples saw it. They get to the bottom of the mountain. This man has a son. Uh, he's been trying to get the demon cast out of his son. And, 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 and Jesus says, but well, you got to believe. And the man goes, I believe. I believe, Jesus. I believe. I believe. I believe. Help me have more belief. You see, it's human nature, our broken nature, our sinful nature to believe and yet doubt. I love the old saying, to know and not to do is not to know. I know God can, but I don't think he will. Anybody ever there? I mean, I know God can heal my mom from her cancer, but I don't want to pray too boldly, because he might not. I know God can fix this job situation I have, this relationship situation I have, this, 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 this conflict that I have. I know he can, but I'm not sure he will. Is that fair? Do a lot of us live in that reality? But Jesus says, if you have faith and you don't doubt, do you pray? Do you pray, seek, ask, and knock with expectation of what God's going to do? I mean, Jesus has been, and Matthew's been covering this all through this gospel. Jesus has been teaching over and over and over again this idea. Ask, seek, knock, pray. Pursue God's will and desire, and it will be given to you. He's a good father. He doesn't give stones instead of bread. He doesn't give snakes instead of blessings. What is the problem? Why do you not expect God to do what God said he would do? Well, that's all fine. That's kind of like a thousand foot view. Let's, let's, let's bring it down home. It's not out here this morning. But how many of y'all are really expecting God to finish these 50 baptisms this year? And why not? Is it too big for God? Is it not God's will to see men and women, boys and girls saved? No! God says, I don't want to save no more. Amen? He's done? Has God told any of you all to quit being on mission? You know, they're supposed to go and make disciples, but you all stop. I'm done here at East Harford. What's your expectation level? I know what you're going to say, well, I believe. But do you believe? And what are you doing about it? You see, to know and not to do is not to know. If you know God wants people saved, if you know God can save people, why aren't you acting on it? Who was the last person you invited to church? Who was the last person you engaged in the gospel? Who was the last person you shared with about what God's done in your life and how he's fixed it and is fixing it and is healing it? This is not a foregone conclusion. We've got... November, December, that's four, eight. We've got at least ten weeks. Why not? Does God need more time than ten weeks? How long does it take God to convict a heart? Have I beat this horse to death already? Probably not. You see, we know that God can do something, but do we expect God to do something? If you have faith and do not doubt, and if you believe, that's the second, second caveat, the second aspect of this real faith that he wants to talk about. Do you believe God's word? Well, of course I do, Andy. I mean, God's word is God's word. I believe it. It's true. Okay. Do you live by it? I try. Okay. Let's just look at one aspect. 
I'm going to take a drink while you ponder what aspect that is. What, what aspect do you think it's going to be? Are you faithful with your money? I know. Preacher, you speak a lot about money. Yep. The checkbook is a wonderful window into your heart, your motivations, and what you prioritize. Are you a tither? A cheerful giver? A sacrificial giver? You see, God's word's pretty clear. I mean, of all the things in here, it's pretty clear. And there's a lot of clear things in here, by the way. But on this, it's pretty clear. We're to give. We're to give the tithe, and we're supposed to give beyond the tithe. The tithe is 10%. Was well, that gross or net, Andy? If you're asking the question, you done missed the point. And besides, what are you doing with the other 90%? It's not like you give 10% to God for the good things and you can go out and do what you want to with the 90%. What are you doing with the other 90% of your money? How are you using it to honor God? How are you using it to build the kingdom? How are you using it to encourage and edify those around you in godly things? You see, if you have faith and if you believe, believe God's word, you'll be following it. Let's just be honest. A lot of us don't believe. Because we just don't do it. It says, if you have faith and you do not doubt and you believe, then you will be able to move mountains. That's really a bad translation. It should be, uh, the, the real translation there should be this. You will be a uprooter of mountains. We lose it in our English translation somehow. It's a Jewish euphemism that the rabbis would use. To be an uprooter of mountains, you need to understand three things about that phrase. First of all, you need to understand what it means. To be an uprooter of mountains is to be an influencer. That means you get things done. If you believe, if you don't doubt, if you have faith, then you will be able to get things done. You'll be able to do the things that God desires for you to do. You need to understand what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean telling a mountain to go jump into the sea. Think about this for a moment. We've been reading 20 other chapters in the Gospel of Matthew. And every time we get to a big crowd, all they want Jesus to do is big stuff. Hey, Jesus, you fed us uh, bread and fish yesterday. We want more. Jesus, show us a sign. Call fire down from heaven. Do something miraculous to prove who you are. And what does Jesus say over and over and over again to him? You adulterous generation of unbelieving, unfaithful people. I, I've done everything, Jesus would say, I've done everything the prophet said I would do as Messiah. I have given sight to the blind. I've caused the lame to walk. I've healed lepers from their leprosy. I have even raised dead people. Me and Debbie were uh, doing some uh, Bible study this past week, and we, we noticed he raised Lazarus, yes. He raised a little girl in Capernaum, yes. He raised some other little boy we found in there. At least three people. Jesus raised dead people. And, and why would he all of a sudden say, well, if you got faith, you can move a mountain. This big, miraculous sign. When all of Jesus' ministry is about not doing the big signs. The only thing Jesus says he's going to do is what his father has already revealed that he's going to do. He revealed it to the prophets. The Messiah will have this kind of ministry. He will preach the good news of the gospel. Blessed are the feet of the him who comes and brings good news. Good news of reconciliation, of peace, of grace, of mercy. He will cause the blind to see, the lame to walk again. He will bring healing to a people. He will sit in the place of David and give sovereignty and reign and rule. These are the things that Jesus accomplished in his ministry. Matter of fact, he said, the only sign I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah. I'm going to be dead for three days and then I'll come back. 
because he understood God's plan for the Messiah. So what Jesus is saying here isn't that you can actually move mountains. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a metaphor. But you got to place it in context of what he is saying. And what he is saying is this. And it's there at the very tail end of this passage. If you have faith, if you don't doubt, if you believe, ask for anything you desire in prayer. And God will give it to you. Now here's the thing. Jesus has been teaching on prayer all through these 20 chapters. Amen? Remember the Lord's Prayer? Say it with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. This, we're going to stop there. <laughs> okay, I did say, just say the whole thing. <laughs> Forgive us our trespasses. We free those around us. Here's the deal though. It's about God's will. Prayer is never your Christmas wish list. Y'all remember back when you were kids? Uh, most of y'all are old enough to remember this. Man, I love the month of August. Amen? August, you got the Sears and Roebuck Christmas wish book. Boy, and it would come in, uh, and all me and my sister would do is fight over that sucker. And I'd have a red marker, and she'd have a, a black marker, and we'd be marking up that book as a what we wanted. That's how a lot of us approach prayer. It's like our wish list. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is about aligning your will with God's will. God, show me what it is that you want. Because here's the thing. Jesus says, the Gospels say, the New Testament tells us, the Old Testament affirms it. That when we pray in the will of God, those are the things that God does. Remember experiencing God we went through a couple years ago? And experiencing God, one of the biggest principles is, don't ask God to come join you, but we do what? We go join God. We look to see where God is working, and that's where we head. We don't ask God to come over here and bless something we want to do. We go to be where God is already blessing His work. God's been very clear. Let's just talk about these baptisms. God wants to see men and women, boys and girls, one to Christ. He didn't send Jesus to die and hang on that cross, shed His blood, be dead for three days just so that we could be willy-nilly about it. He didn't pour out the wrath of the universe upon him, separating him so that we could kind of maybe do the job. God wants people saved. Our only job is to go out and share the news. We don't save them. We don't know who's going to get saved. In some way, this is going to be a very controversial statement here. Hang with me, though. Let me finish it. I don't care who gets saved. That's up to God. My job, what I care about, is making sure that I've shared the gospel with each and every person that God has put before me so that they have a chance to be saved. I'm going to tell you what, it takes a lot of pressure off me. When I, when, I was, when I was first in the church, when I, when I was nine years old, nine to about 19, I felt this great pressure that if I don't get out there and share the gospel, if I don't get out there and tell people about Jesus, man, people are going to die and go to hell. That's not the way it works. God will save those he wants to save. I've been commanded to be part of the process of sharing the gospel. I had a good friend. His name was Kevin. I remember, I remember uh, I'd been saved for about two or three weeks. I've told this story before, but there's so many people here, so you need to hear this. This is how zealous I was. I remember telling Kevin that he needed to get saved, and then I punched Kevin in the gut, threw him on the ground, took my big King Jimmy, which was a hardcover, and started hitting him on the head with it to make him get saved. Not an evangelism technique you want to use. I don't know that Kevin ever accepted Jesus ever. <laughs> But I had a desire to have my best friend know Jesus. No training. <laughs> and I still have a desire for people to know who Jesus is. I have family members that I'm praying for. I have friends in my circle of influence that I'm praying for. I have church members that I'm praying for. I have some of your family members that I'm praying for. I have connections out at Walmart and Bob's and in the community that I'm not for certain if they know Jesus or not, I'm praying for. 
and I'm looking for opportunities to, to, to say a word about the gospel when I can. Prayer. Asking God to bring the rest of the 50. How many more do we have? How many? 39. Woo! I don't know if God can actually do 39 in, in two and a half months. He can't. Wouldn't that be awesome? Let's give us a week off. So instead of 10 weeks, we only got nine weeks. How many baptisms per week do we have to have for in, in over nine weeks to have the, four, the 39 done? What if we have 39 baptisms on one Sunday? What would happen? What would, what would, what would cause? What, how would that change things in your reality? What if you started actually spending your money the way God wants you to spend it? What kind of blessing could that be to this church, this community, the mission field? What if you started loving your wife, men, the way God tells us to love our wives? Sacrificially, giving up our wants and our desires to help them become everything that Jesus desires of them. Wives, you're not the hook. What would change in your homes if you started submitting to the authority of your husband who's leading you in a godly manner and started following his leadership as he's leading faithfully the things of Christ? How would that stuff impact and affect this body and this community? I think we'd have 39 baptisms like that. The reason why this is so hard is because we don't live it out the way we need to. Notice in this praying, and it's not just praying the Father's will. Notice what James says over in James chapter 4 verse 3. He says, you ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend it on your own pleasures, your own desires. Are you praying for God's will to be done? And do you understand this? God's will may just really stink in your life. I got some students over at the college that, uh, that I work with, and, and I had to remind them, because we, we do this survey at the end of the class, about are you a good fit for the church you're in? And they take this survey and they go, I'm not a good fit. I, I believe these things, my church believes these things, and, and I want to take the church here, and the church doesn't want to go there, they want to go over here. And, and all of a sudden they start going, God's got me in the wrong place. And i got to remind them of something. Maybe not. Sometimes God places you where he places you so you can be a catalyst for them, or maybe he's trying to teach you something while you're in the midst of this situation. I remember a mentor of mine years ago, as I was going through a, a little big crisis, he looked at me and said, the things you're going through right now is God shaping you to the pressure of this crisis so that you can be given more responsibility later? I, I looked at it. My mentor, his name was Eddie, and I said, that stinks. I don't want to do anything else. I'm happy with the status quo. But think about it. Growth never happens without stress and pressure. Spent this last week on the beach with Layla, my little granddaughter. You hear her back there. She's having a ball. Keep it up. I don't care. And I made the comment before yet. They were driving down there. And, um, they didn't ride with us. They flew. They're, they're hotty toddy. They, 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 can't, they can't make a 10-hour trip in a car. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Paul may not have been that much fun <laughs> after a 10 hour ride. But we're driving down, and I said to Debbie, I said, You know when she's going to be really fun? When she can actually talk and she can run. And then I was watching her this week as she was walking in the sand and wobbling and falling down and getting up and little spurts of running. You know what? All she wanted to do was go. It didn't matter how many times she fell, where she hit her head, what went on. She picked herself up and got going again. Now, Debbie, she had a fall a couple weeks ago, uh, and all hers, oh, come get me, come get me. I was in the middle of watching a football game. I'm upstairs. I'm in the, it's at the, it's at the last minute and a half. It's the crucial point of the game. And I hear, downstairs in the basement, and I hear, Andy, shut up, woman. Don't you know what's going on? 
I've fallen. But call someone who cares. <laughs> but we, we face crisis and it devastates us. But man, all she wants to do is walk and run and play and she doesn't realize what she's going through. That's the way God places us in the pressures of life. If you're going through something right now, if you're feeling the stress and the anxiety and the strain, and if you're being godly, if you're doing what the Bible says, if you're doing what's right, if you're following God's example, if you're seeking His will and aligning your life with Him in the right prayer, then know this, He's using those situations to shape you so that you can be more useful to Him and His kingdom somewhere down the road. That's why you're going through the junk you're going through right now. Or went through the junk you just went through. Or you're going to be going through the junk you're fixing to go through. Because God's not done with you. If you're being faithful to follow Him. Now if you're being unfaithful, He might be using it to chastise you to get you back. That's a whole different sermon. So, if we're going to have faith, real faith, it needs to be the type of faith that doesn't doubt and it believes and we seek God out. Uh, 1 John 5.14 says this, however this is the confidence we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will he will hear us. So what we ask for in his will he will hear us. We can be uprooters of mountain, influencers, get things accomplished in God's will, not our will because our motivation is to see his kingdom grow. So what kind of faith do you have? Real quick, let's work our way through the first 20 verses here of this passage. Chapter 21, verse 1. This is a very familiar passage, so I'm just going to work our way through these 22, 22 verses, and then we're going to come back and pick out four things, four things that I've, I've, I've kind of seen in here to help us have real faith, okay? Let's read. It says, when they approached Jerusalem, that's uh, when, when Jesus and his uh, disciples, now you need to understand something, this is Jesus and his entourage, this is his posse. It's more than just the 12. Uh, there's probably about 150 people traveling with them. Uh, we know that because, remember in the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 2, in the upper room, uh, Judas has hung himself and they're trying to pick his replacement. And part of the deal is, uh, the only people that can replace one of the existing apostles is someone who's been traveling with them throughout the time of Jesus' ministry. they got at least two candidates, and Matthias is the one that gets chosen to be the replacement for Judas, according to the Old Testament scriptures and prophecies that they followed. So we know that there were several people beyond the twelve that followed Jesus around. So... When they approached Jerusalem and, and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives. Now, Bethphage is a little bitty town, a little bitty village, a little bitty itty bitty, bitty village. It's just on the other side of the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the hill that surrounds the eastern side of Jerusalem. Uh, imagine, if you will, here's Jerusalem down in the bottom of this valley, the Kidron Valley. You have the Mount of Olives, which comes up over here. Bethphage set right on the edge of it. So it's right at the edge of when you crest over and make your way down. It's about a half a mile to a mile from the crest of the, of the Mount of Olives down to uh, where you enter into Jerusalem, through the eastern gate. So when they approached uh, Jerusalem, came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus uh, sent two of his disciples telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey, and there will be with her foal. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to, uh, to, to if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place so that what was spoken to the prophet might be fulfilled. The, 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 what we are reading here comes out of Zechariah 9.9. 9. It says, Tell daughter Zion, see your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed. They brought the donkey and its foal, and they laid their clothes on them. And he said on them, Jesus said on them, A very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. When the crowd, when, then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar saying, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Uh, that Hosanna. This is, this is Palm Sunday. We, we know this. We talk about it every Easter season. It's not a story that if you've been in church in any part of your life that you probably haven't heard. But just in case you haven't, 
he, he, he gets to Jerusalem. He's just getting ready to crest the hill to go down into the Kidron Valley, to cross over to go to the Eastern Gate. And he knows God's word. He knows the prophecies. He knows the fulfillment of them. He sends two of his disciples to get this, this colt, the foal of a donkey. And not just the colt, the mama donkey comes too. They bring him back. They spread their coats and their cloaks on the donkey. Jesus sits on it. And he rides it into Jerusalem to fulfill what Zechariah had prophesied years ago. Behold Jerusalem. Your king is coming. Jesus is proclaiming who he is loud and clear to the people. And the crowds that are gathered on that road begin to cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Praise to the Messiah. Praise to the Son who comes, to the one who comes in the line of David. They didn't miss who he was. They didn't, they didn't misunderstand what he was proclaiming. That, that word Hosanna, it, it originally was a plea for salvation, a cry to be saved. Hosanna, God save us. But it had morphed into a praise at this point for God's salvation and God's salvific power in the lives of those he was working through. Now, in the Old Testament, their idea of salvation wasn't what our idea of salvation is in the New Testament. But their idea was that, that God was working his will through his people to bring them about into a, a situation that would see the Messiah come so they might be saved from their daily lives. And when he gets to Jerusalem... The whole city's in an uproar. Who is this? Now, I find it interesting. The crowd doesn't say, this is the Messiah. What do they say? This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth. They still don't quite understand who Jesus is. It says Jesus, uh, starting in verse 12 there. Jesus went into the temple. He threw out all of those buying and selling he overturned the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer. That comes from Isaiah 56, verse 7. But you are making it a den of thieves. He combined two Bible passages, two prophets. That's Jeremiah 7, 11. Wouldn't you have liked to have seen this? Can you imagine if he was one of Jesus' disciples? This had to be the best day of your life. He's been out in the countryside. He's been keeping everybody quiet about who he is. And now he's come in. They're crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. They're, he's, he's not holding back. He's, 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 he's fulfilling the, the prophecy of Zechariah 9. He gets into the temple and he's showing his power and his might. He's, he's, he's chasing them out. calling them out. This had to be a great day for those who were following him. He's finally going to do it. He's going to raise the rebellion. We're going to overthrow the Romans. We're going to see religious reform. We're going to finally get what we deserve. Verse 14. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonders that he did and the children shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? Jesus replied, Yes. Have you never read? Then he quotes from Psalm 8, verse 2. He says, You have prepared praises from the mouths of infants and nursing babies. Then he left them, Jesus, Jesus left them, went out of the city to Bethany, which was about two miles away from Jerusalem, and he spent the night there. Remember in Bethany are, are, are his friends, Lazarus. Mary and Martha. And we believe he stayed at their house. Verse 18. Early in the morning, the next day, as he was re returning to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he went up to it and found nothing on it except leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And at once the fig tree withered. That sounds kind of, kind of harsh, doesn't it? I mean, the fig tree didn't, I mean, it didn't have any fruit on it. See, something to understand about fig trees, especially in that climate and culture, is that uh, when they start having leaves that are budding, uh, most oftentimes, even though it's out of season, they'll start producing fruit. It, it may be immature fruit, it may be small fruit, it may not be ripened fruit yet, but, but 
there should have been something there and there was nothing Jesus was ready to eat Jesus was ready to engage Jesus had come to the fig plant the fig tree and was ready to make use of it and it wasn't ready you see in the Old Testament uh, the fig tree, the fig plant it represents Israel a lot of times in the prophecy and what we see here is a picture of the condition of Israel at this time God in Christ the Messiah had come he was ready to be about his work he gets to Israel the fig tree and they're unprepared there is no fruit there's nothing there for him to work with and he says cursed are you for not being ready this is where the question comes from that Jesus answers uh, it's interesting, uh, let's just finish reading there uh, in verse uh, 20. When the, when the disciples saw it, they were amazed and said, How did the fig tree wither so quickly? They didn't question that the fig tree withered, but how did it wither so quickly? How was it here a moment ago and it's gone, withered, dead? And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, truly, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even to tell mount, this mountain be lifted and thrown into the sea, it will be done. And if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. What Jesus is saying here, very simply, is we need to be ready to engage God. Those are the events that Matthew records before he gets to this meat of teaching. And let me just real quickly give you these four things. This is not rocket science, okay? I debated uh, trying to figure out how much to say and how to articulate all this and how to sound like I really knew what I'm talking about. And here's the deal. The Bible pretty, says, pretty much just says it pretty plainly. Uh, what I like to do when I do Bible study is I like to find the heart of the teaching, the meat of the teaching, the meat of the teaching is right here. Jesus says, let me tell you some truth. If you do these things, then these things will happen. That's the meat of the teaching. So why did Matthew include that meat here in this story? Why did Matthew put these events together to give us a detail of what it looks like to have faith? Here's what I pulled out of it. Here's what real faith looks like. Real faith is humble. If you're taking notes, these are going to be the, the four things there. Real faith is humble, the triumphant entry. Notice that even though Jesus is proclaiming who he is, he's humbling himself to God's will. God, 500 years earlier, had through the prophet Zechariah said, this is how the Messiah is going to walk in. Jesus could have walked in with an army behind him, going, I'm the king. He could have put a Ric Flair, Whoa! I'm here. Instead, he did it just the way God said to do it. Jesus, who is God, Jesus, who is King of kings, Lord of lords, humbled himself to the will of the Father. Paul would write in Philippians that Jesus did not see it right to be counted as equal to the Father. So he divested himself of some of his attributes. He set aside some of his godliness so that he might submit to the will of the Father. Real faith is humble. Real faith is God-fearing. Notice, we see this in the cleansing of the temple. Jesus and those who follow Jesus desire to worship God in the way that God desires to be worshipped. You know, that's the biggest problem in our society today. We want to redefine who God is based upon who we want God to be instead of being who we are meant to be in Christ. Here's what God desires. God desires for his house to be a house of prayer and a house of healing. Do you understand that this isn't the house? This is 1309 Clay Street. You are the house. Are you a place of prayer aligning yourself with God's will? And are you a vessel of healing? Bringing a reconciling word, word to a hurt and dying world so that men and women, boys and girls, can receive salvation and know who God is. Real faith is humble. Real faith is God-fearing. Real faith is merciful. We see this in the healing of the sick and the lame, the blind and the diseased. 
This is God's desire that we show mercy. Remember, grace is the giving of something you don't deserve. Mercy is the withholding of something you do deserve. And reconciliation is that act that God does between sinful man and holy God where he brings us back into a right relationship with him as if it never had been broken. It's not a piece of tape or, or adhesive or our best glue job or some staples. It is rest- restoration perfectly back to God's plan for how he desires to function with you. That's amazing. It doesn't happen overnight. It does happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens in the moment you accept them because you're justified and boom. But we spend the rest of our life here on this planet waiting to be fully reconciled with him as we're being restored, sanctified, being made holy so that we can be with him for eternity. You see, we see this in Jesus healing the people that came to him. Are you about the business of doing what God has called you to do? Are you showing his mercy? Real faith is confident. I love this. The kids are praising. There's another passage uh, in another one of the Gospels. It says, if I tell the kids to be quiet, the stones will cry out. My creation knows who I am. The words of Jesus. And the people that should have known who he was were the ones that were indignant. Shut these kids up. Don't you know this is blasphemy? Do you confidently know who Jesus is? And are you willing to live your life for that? And the real faith is fruitful. Real faith is fruitful. If you're a disciple, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to bear fruit. It may be immature fruit. It may be early fruit. It may be ripe fruit. It may be big fruit. It may be small fruit. But you're going to bear fruit. And this is a principle Jesus teaches over and over and over and over again. Just, let's walk down memory road real quick. Parable of the four soils, remember? Hard path, rocky, path, rocky soil, thorny soil, good soil. What does the good soil do? It produces fruit. What about the parable of the good trees and the bad trees? Good trees produce good fruit. Bad trees produce bad fruit. What about the parable of the two paths, the two gates, the two foundations? Jesus talks about this over and over and over and over again. You cannot be a follower of Jesus. You cannot be a a, a disciple of Jesus and not be bearing fruit. What kind of fruit are you bearing? Is there evidence of your faith in your life? Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Jesus follower, I have this question for you. Disciple of Christ, do you have real faith? Are you humbly following God's will for your life? Do you worship the Lord your God in fear and wonder? Are you practicing mercy? Do you show confidence in knowing God's will? Are you producing fruit? And if not, this morning's invitation is for you to come and just get right with God. And say, I want to have the type of faith that doesn't doubt, that does believe, and that does produce fruit. Maybe this morning you're here and you're not a Jesus follower. Are you ready to humble yourself before a holy God? Are you ready to worship the Lord Jesus in fear and trembling? Are you ready to seek his mercy and to be healed of your sin, your brokenness? Are you ready to confidently proclaim that Jesus is your Lord, the one and only true God, crucified for your sin, buried and raised to new life? Are you ready to bear the fruit of your salvation? The invitation for you this morning is to come and to receive that gift. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this word. I thank you for the fact that you have called us to be a faithful people. And God, I thank you that real faith, real faith is a humble faith. Real faith is a God-fearing faith. Real faith is merciful. Real faith is being confident in who you are and who I am, who we are in you. 
in real faith, you don't have to wonder about whether I have it or not because it produces fruit. Even if it's premature fruit, even if it's little fruit, even if it's immature fruit, there is evidence in our lives. God, this morning I pray simply this. Would you help us to understand what you're doing in the midst of our lives, that we might trust you, follow you, and believe in you so that we might share you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.